Oh, hello and welcome to Rosie's Preserving School. Uh, tonight we're going to be, or today rather, we're going to be looking at uh, salt. Uh, I know we've covered salt quite extensively when we did the salted lemons, but there's still more to know. And as ever, with preserving, you never stop learning. And uh, it's surprising <laughs> what rises to the surface when you think you're done with the subject. But because we're going to be making basically herb salts tonight or variations of, then uh, we're just going to have a bit of a recap on the different types of salt and also uh, how salt figures in the, in the preserving world. And of course, it's one of the important trilogy of natural preservatives, the salt, sugar, vinegar combination been around for thousands and thousands of years uh, since the dawn of the, of the planet and a very, very important preservative and probably one of the simplest to use apart from just hanging things up to dry in the air. Salt draws out moisture and as we know, moisture means uh, decay because yeast and molds and bacteria all need moisture to thrive and multiply and to spoil your food. So if you sort things, you're naturally, uh, through osmotic pressure, the water will come out of the cells of whatever you're trying to preserve and it will shrink for a start because the water will be gone and it will also be uh, inhospitable to the things that would love to devour it, to, to proliferate. That's basically what it does. And then when you're, you can just leave it like that, as we know with things like salt cod and um, other salted meats and things like that, that's just salted, that's it. And it's kept like that until it's needed for use. Uh, it can take the form of a brine, which is slightly counterintuitive because you think you're putting it in something wet to draw water out. But it's all to do, as I say, with osmotic pressure and the uh, salt water is, a, a, I don't know which way around it is, I could, my uh, um, physics classes and chemistry classes were a long time ago, but one draws the moisture out because it's stronger than the other. And I guess it's the salt, the brine that is. I prefer, especially as I teach lots and lots of beginners, I think brine is quite a difficult concept to get your head around, making it to the right sort of strength and all that kind of thing. And I'm never quite sure if it's drawn enough moisture out because it's it's in water anyway or in the salty brine. So it's a bit difficult to tell. Uh, and I think if you're unsure and um, slightly nervous about it, it's much simpler and easier to just chuck a whole load of salt on something, leave it for a, a, up to 24 hours or slightly more, and then you can see all the liquid that's been drawn out of the whatever, you know, whatever you're trying to prepare, like uh, pickled onions or vegetables for pickled lily, that kind of thing, or any kind of pickles will need salting. Um, the, the salt draws out the moisture. And then when you, if you want to preserve it as a pickle, you're going to be adding your vinegar and possibly sugar as well. You may end up with all three preservatives playing their part. And that mixture, the vinegar mixture, will replace the, the water that's come out of the cells of the pickled onions, say, or the onions. It's a bit like when you sit in the bath too long you know, and you get wrinkled fingers. That's what happens to the things that you're preparing and they kind of shrivel up and don't look very nice. You put in the vinegar and they take that in and they swell up again with the vinegar and that preserves and keeps them. So bear that in mind if you're preparing anything and especially if you're in a hurry, you can't miss that stage out. So, you know, if you've got things to prepare and you're going on holiday the next day and you think, oh, I can't, I'll just chuck them in a jar and pour the vinegar over. What could be wrong? You know, what could go wrong? But the problem with that is the, the water in the cells of the onions in this case will mix with the vinegar, dilute it. And as we've said before, 
vinegar needs to be at a level of at least 5% acetic acid. Uh, the acidic level must be at least 5%. And if you mix it with water, you're reducing it down to sort of three, maybe 2%. And that won't preserve anything and you'll end up growing something nasty called botulism in the jar and it which is highly dangerous and, and can be fatal if you eat them. Uh, especially if you're a vulnerable um, person, you know, you've got a com compromised immune system or you're young or very elderly very very dangerous and the, the way you, it's very obvious that that's what's happened because for a start they will be fizzing like mad that, and they're not supposed to be fizzy you know pickles so there'll be all bubbles sort of going up through the jar the lid will almost certainly be domed with the excess pressure from all the gas in the jar so that will be uh, raised up which it shouldn't be and when you open it it will just explode and go everywhere and you'll have a very strong sort of sulfurous smell so don't look at it and think mm, oh they'll probably be all right <laughs> put them in the bin uh, safely uh, wrapped and all the rest of it and you know learn from the, the lesson you must do the sorting process to make them safe but looking at salt again it is a fascinating thing. We cannot have human life without salt in our body. Yet it's one of the one of the few chemicals that we need. Chemicals, you know what I mean. It's not not a, a nasty chemical. <laughs> um, it's one of the few things that we need that we can't make ourselves. We have to eat it. We, the body doesn't produce it. Like in uh, with glucose for instance the body produces glucose i know we eat that as well but we do produce it but we don't produce salt and at any one time we've got 200 grams of salt in an adult body which is quite a lot really when you think 200 grams weighed out um, and that salt has to be replaced as it's used and it has it's made up of sodium and chloride in equal parts, one to one. Uh, now, when I found that out, I thought that rings a bell. And it's the same with sugar. Uh, the sugar that we use is equal parts glucose and fructose, which we can metabolize. Obviously, to an extent, we don't need sugar in our body and we don't create it from, you know, in the same way as we don't create salt but we can met metabolize it and used in moderation, it is a natural thing for us to actually eat and process. And that is also one-to-one. -one. So I'm beginning, there's a pattern here. And I think the pattern that we need in life is balance. And as long as things are equal and, uh, it, and they're, they're natural, then we're pretty much on the right road. Um, it's essential for efficient muscle function. It helps with hydration. And we all know if we're thirsty, you know, if we have a lot of salt, then we get very thirsty uh, to sort of neutralize it. And it also is very important in the sending electrical pulses to the brain, electrical messages from around the body, the state of the, of the, of the body. And I know this to my own, my own cost, because uh, when you have um, lymph nodes removed, which I have, uh, the lymph um, system is very similar to the blood system in the body. And they have little sort of shuttered gates on them, which are open and closed by electrical impulses. And the salt in the body, the sodium, works with potassium to switch these little gates on and off and maintain the flow of lymph around the body evenly. And the lymph cleans the body. It goes around the body, picking up um, rubbish, basically, from the blood, taking it, cleaning it, returning the, the, the fluid to the lymph system. And that's what keeps us healthy. That's what um, overcomes infection and keeps us well. 
but if you've had lymph nodes removed, you have um, a certain impairment. It doesn't work very well. And I had very, very low potassium, which hadn't been picked up. And the salt um, couldn't, the sodium couldn't work with the potassium to switch my lymph sort of gates on and off the valves in, in the system. So I now have a permanently swollen arm, which I can't do anything about. Um, you know, it just, it just is. But that is how delicate the balance is that for a few days I was very low in potassium and that those electrical impulses that were triggered by salt couldn't work. And it, it's, um, I think we get too bogged down in the, the, the kind of um, information that we have about what's good and bad for us. It's all a matter of balance and moderation really and paying attention to what we actually need and paying attention to eating food that we know what is in it. Now I'll go on about the processed food, but because processed food has a lot of glucose fructose in it to make it work through all the processing equipment, to make it addictive and to make it cheap, it also makes everything very, very sweet. And you will find to counteract that in processed food, lots and lots of salt. And the one fact I can remember is pizza dough, for instance, has the equivalent of 26 teaspoons full of salt in it, which if you tried to eat that, you would be sick immediately. Um, so it, examine the labels again. And, you know, it, it's tedious, but really it's simpler. If you don't go and have to shop and read all the labels, you can just make some dough. You don't have to do it with yeast. You can just make like a pastry dough put your pizza toppings on and that's it you know what's in it and nobody's getting a huge amount of sugar counteracted by excess salt um of course uh it has a very sort of um uh mythical thing of being a good luck charm you know people throw salt over their shoulder to sort of keep them safe and all this sort of thing goodness knows where that's come from but for our lives, the preservation powers that it has is probably uppermost in our minds most of the time. I've got my salt samples here in front, which we will sort of run through again. Um, I think uh, the camera will be arriving any minute. <laughs> Wait while it crawls on the floor. <laughs> oh dear. So we have here, this is a coarse sea salt. So it's quite lumpy and uh, gritty. And that comes into play with the salts that we're going to make this evening, really. Um, it has, if, if you use a, a, a coarse sea salt, it helps to grind down whatever you're adding into the salt to, to help with the grinding process. This is the Himalayan uh, pink rock salt as well, which comes from the foothills of the Himalaya, Himalayan mountains. It's, it's got, I think it's 84 different trace elements in it. It's very, very good for you. It has all sorts of minerals and, and things like that. Uh, you'll have to read it up. I don't know what all the 84 are. But of the salts, this is the, uh, the sort of um, gold... Uh, gold rosette one but it is expensive that's the downside because it's it only occurs in one place and it has to be mined and it has to be processed uh, and so on and anything that is sort of more scarce is going to be more expensive this is the uh, flaky soft sea salt I love this that you can crumble it between your fingers uh, I add it, uh, if I'm cooking, that's the salt I use, but more of that in a minute. Uh, there's all sorts, they're produced all over the world, all over the UK. You, they all taste slightly different. You can be loyal to one that's produced near to you. You can go by price or you can do a taste test and see which one you prefer. And of course, in France, you get a lot of the, um, what they call it, 
cell gris, which is the, the, the it's slightly gray, the salt, which is, comes from all the minerals in the salt pans there. Going along, we've got uh, just plain old rock salt. Now, if you're going to put this on, on your drive or the roadway to de-ice de uh, in the winter, it will be just as it comes out of the uh, ground. It, it's all in um, sort of seams underground. We've got a lot in the UK and it's mined. And it's cheaper than the sea salts and the Himalayan, Himalayan um, pink salt. Uh, but this has been refined for cooking. So all the grayness, all the gritty bits and all the stuff that is in the one that they use on the roads has been taken out. But again, it's, it's on a par with the, the uh, sea salt, the coarse sea salt for its grinding powers. It's good if you've got a salt grinder that you use like a pepper mill. Um, it's good, that's what it's produced for, to go into those mills so that it can be ground up at the table. But it's also very good for making the herb salts. Now going along to the end one, which is a table salt. Now, I've always said for years and years and years, if I'm salting something to get the water out of it, I use cheap old table salt because it's not being absorbed by the, the whatever you're putting it on. It's going to be washed off. So just use the cheapest you can find. And that's what I've always said in good faith. Uh, but I've recently found, and I, I, I'll read it uh, to you so that I get it right. Um, because people worried about the anti-caking agents in it, which when I was young, salt used to absorb the damp and everything and you couldn't get it out of salt cellars and things. But they put um, something in it which is called silicium dioxide, which keeps it flowing. Mains, we don't have all that issue. And it doesn't clump together in lumps. It doesn't compress down and compact. It's as it says, it's an anti-caking agent. It doesn't cake together. And until recently, it was considered quite safe for human consumption calls for effect. But there's been news new research which shows that nanoparticles of the silicium dioxide irritate uh they 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 are literally nanoparticles and they adhere to the stomach lining and to the lining of the bowel and then they they cause irritation and that sets up a process of uh, you know just soreness really and irritation to the lining of the stomach and the bowel. And so now the recommendation is that they are reduced in food processing. Now, I d I'm not a scientist, but I do know that until I was probably in my 30s, I'd not heard of irritable bowel syndrome or all those kind of things that we now have. And I'm just wondering now, after reading that, if that isn't the cause, or at least one of the causes uh, that this irritation is being set up. It's like some people have hay fever, don't they? And other people don't suffer from it at all. Um, and it may be in susceptible people that it's one of the things that trigger uh, the irritation and the discomfort. I don't know, but it's worth avoiding, I think, if you can. So from now on, I'm going to be using sea salt to do everything. Um, whether I use, I'll try rock salt as well, because it would be cheaper and see if it draws out enough to, to be effective. I'm not really sure what will, what will happen, but hopefully that would be the case. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's disturbing to read after all this time, isn't it? That, you know, they suddenly find something that they've told us for, you know, decades is perfectly safe, actually isn't. Um, just one other little thing. Well, there's more than one other little thing. <laughs> um, an interesting thing is uh, I wanted to make some for you, but I'm not sure, I wasn't sure really how I could actually do it without it all getting, you know, going haywire. But um, you're probably aware that uh, years ago that they made ice cream 
by having cream and sugar and vanilla in a bowl, in a bigger bowl, which had ice packed around it. And when you add salt to that ice, the temperature goes down quite a lot. And you can stir the, the cream in the bowl and make ice cream very, very quickly. Um, and I've always wanted to do this and I've never kind of got myself set up to do it. And I, I'm afraid I sort of chickened out tonight. But there's also a thing called the two bag ice cream mix on uh, Pinterest, which is two Ziploc bags, one bigger than the other, cream and sugar and vanilla in the, in the smaller one, ice and salt in the bigger one, put the little one in the bigger one, do it up and then just do this until it turns into ice cream, which again is sort of a fun thing to do, perhaps with children in the holidays, if we ever get any summer. And, uh, and very quick and easy, you know, you don't have a great big ice cream maker in your freezer and all that palaver. Um, so I thought that would be one thing to have a go at. Now, we haven't talked very much, apart from the uh, lemon vinegar, about cleaning with uh, natural ingredients. And I'm not going to talk much about it tonight, but it's certainly something that I will draw in as and when. You know, I said about when you make your, put your discarded lemon shells into uh, distilled or, or cider vinegar, all those, um, all the oils come out of the skin that's left. And instead of just tossing them in the bin, get all that oil out into the vinegar and it becomes a highly effective antibacterial cleaner for you can uh, the you can put the vinegar in a bucket with hot water and some dish soap and mop the floors you can use it in a spray 50 50 to do surfaces windows mirrors bathrooms whatever so that's the vinegar part of it um, I've got a book here that I absolutely love. It's by Rebecca Sullivan and it's called The Art of Natural Cleaning. And there's some fascinating things in here that um, <laughs> I'm thinking away. <laughs> and it's a lovely little book. And she's got uh, some great ideas in here. Uh, practically every page is a great idea. Some you will know, some you won't. And she said her, her nan always told her that salt was magic. And in her family, they always have um, a salt shaker. So uh, a, a jam jar with the lid with holes poked in it, filled with salt, and then half a lemon to clean pots and pans and things like that, the, the kitchen sink, shake the salt, use the lemon, and uh, that's uh, the job done. Going on, we have oven cleaner, and she says, if you only try one recipe in this book, make it this one, and free yourself from chemical oven cleaner forever. You know, that awful, you've got your head in the oven and there's all the ammonia and it all gets in the back of your throat. But this is just a good old bicarbonate soda, which we talked about, you know, how effective that is. Uh, white vinegar, so distilled malt vinegar, some coarse salt and a spray bottle. And you just make a paste, spread it on, spray it, with um, the water and it all starts to activate. It, the, the, it's um, all the um, instructions are there. But it, the great thing is it's not toxic. And what I find um, even now, my son, even though he's grown up, is still very badly affected with asthma. And your, your chemicals in your household cleaners are the worst possible things for asthmatics because the residue stays in the room and it can be, uh, breathe, you can breathe it in and it, it makes your chest tight and everything. So I've always looked at things that don't involve propellants and chemicals in the actual cleaner. And uh, it, you know, it's just a nicer place to be really. And then of course you can clean your chopping board, good old salt, half a lemon on a wooden chopping board and give it a good, um, scrub, rinse it off and let it dry. And 
it's supposed to be most effective if you leave it to dry in the sun because the sun is also a great cleaner of things. I'll leave that over there and I expect Trevor will put it up on the screen for you so that you've got the number if you want to have a look at it. Um, oh, Karis is saying she won't be able to come tonight so she'll catch up on the, uh, on the video. And lastly, this is the book uh, that I recommended to you when we were talking about salt uh, with um, the salted lemons. It literally has got everything you could probably need to know about salt. Maybe not the latest research on the on the um, <laughs> the anti caking things, but it, it's all things like um, folklore and where things have come from. There's bath treatments, cleaning uses, food related uses, where all the different salts come from, how to use them for curing food and or everything you could possibly want. And it's just a, a simple little book. And I think I picked this one up in a motorway services one time, probably one of those with a big orange sticker on the front, which said three pounds or something. Uh, I'll, I'll get Trev to put the ISBN number up for you. It says it's 6.99 now. So, you know, it's still not, still not expensive for something that is so packed with masses of information about how salt is produced, where it comes from, all the different things that um, I can't possibly tell you in the time that we've got. So moving on from the sort of background, I'll move those forward so they're out of the way. Um, salts, uh, I was talking before we started that Herb salts, flavoured salts, I wish it had a sort of sexier name really because I think what you end up with is far greater than just herb salt. Um, you know, I keep, I, I've put them on my uh, um, Instagram guides as super salts and that's how I like to sort of think because you've got all the benefit of the salt plus some super uh, flavourings and, and all that kind of thing. And really, um, the world's your oyster here. You can literally make it up as you go along. Um, and they make great uh, products if you sell at markets and so on. It would be a super thing to have that is completely shelf stable. You don't have to worry about, you know, keeping it refrigerated and all this business. And it would draw people to you because it's unusual. And most people who end up at markets as a preserver, you know, take all the germs and the chutneys, maybe they make some sauces. But these peripheral things, which are really interesting, would draw people to you and then enable you to upsell with your other products, I think. Anyway, but um, we're going to be making tonight the orange thyme and rosemary herb salt, uh, which is in this jar here, which you can see. Uh, you know, all the flex in there and everything. But I've just got some others that I uh, have been making. I just, what I tend to do, say for instance, like last week we used those fresh bird's eye chilies, where I only use two and they come in, you know, they, we have to buy them in a packet, so there's about 10. So I use some of them uh, with the Himalayan pink salt the bird's eye chilies and some lime zest all whizzed up together and it smells amazing. And so you've got all the flecks of the red chilies in there you, and you've got the bits of green from the limes. You don't use the juice, I'm going to make some cordial with, with the rest of it, uh, but the uh, just, just the skin and you get all the oils, as I said, we've said before, we've talked about the zest of citrus fruit is packed with oil. All those little dimples are all little oil wells. That's where most of the, the kind of iconic flavor is. When you think of a lime, you get that idea in your head of what, what it is. Um, and this, this is what that smells like because it's got all that oil from, I've used the zest of two limes in, in um, in this salt and uh, it's all in there with the chili. Now, if you like things like Bloody Mary's, the, you know, the tomato juice, 
you could use that as the salt that goes around the, the top of the glass. You've got the chili, it's got the lime, the salt. Um, you know, you probably have other uses for it than just that. But I just thought that's the thing that would be, again, a great product to sell or a great gift to give. All these things can be, you know, interchangeable and used uh, as gifts, unusual gifts that people uh, won't expect. You know, it's one thing to have a jar of your marmalade or something like that. But when it's really interesting, um, give it with some ideas of how to use it as well, because people don't have a lot of imagination and they kind of don't use it because they think they have to have permission to use it in a certain way. Or actually, you can just use it, you know, if you fancy it on your omelet or something, that's fine. You know, you don't have to be told it's OK. Uh, the next one along is just straightforward lime. I say straightforward, it smells incredible. And again, you can see it very green. It's got the flecks of the, the zest of the lime in there. And uh, uh, it's very, very delicious. I'll leave that one for a moment. This lovely green one here is wild garlic. Uh, so I, I showed you the wild garlic butter I'd made. This is wild garlic salt. So all that is very, very garlicky. So when you open it, so if you need garlic in something or you like it on your food, you can use this as a cook in salt or you can use it as a finishing salt on your actual food. And this one here is quite uh, decadent. This is a black truffle salt. So uh, it's just uh, black truffle, which I finely grated. Well, I didn't actually, I just chopped it and put it in and uh, whizzed it up in the processor. And you can see the black flecks in there. So you can add in uh, along with the truffle oil, I made, again, a great combo for a gift for a cook or somebody who likes good food and is interested. So keep them in small jars, though, um, you know, because they go further. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, you, if you're just making a general herb salt for your own use, you can have it in a clip top jar by the, by the hole. But I think if you're thinking of selling or gifting, you need it in a smaller jar. This is a 120 ml jar this size. Just have some water. The other thing is, I think, if you're gifting these to people is to give them some idea of how to use them and tell them a little bit about it so that it kind of spreads the word about why it's important to have all these things in our lives. And they're not big in their own way, but they all are starting to build. I think you see over the weeks, it's all starting to paint a picture of little and often, quickly made, but how much it enhances what we eat and what we enjoy. And it's much, much better for us. So uh, to make our herb salt, I'm going to use, I um, huh, haven't actually got any salt out to use. It's mad, isn't it? What I'll do is use these two together. I'm so busy getting the uh, salt ready to show you. That's fine. I've got my uh, little processor here. And we're, we're making um, the rosemary and thyme, orange thyme and rosemary herb salt. As you probably gathered, you can make it with anything, but this is particularly nice. It's got that um, lovely citrus, uh, orange, uh, you, you know, you can smell the orange in it. And this is the actual one that is uh, in the photographs on your recipe sheet. And it went off to the photographer. She, she's a lovely girl and she always gets, I have to put all the different recipes in different bags so she knows what's what. And she said, oh, what's this? What's this? And, and she opened it and, and just sniffed it. And she said, oh, I, I want to put that on my chips. 
And ever since then, that's what I've done. I never thought of putting it on chips, but it, I, when I bake, because I always bake, um, you know, potatoes cut as chips in the oven in olive oil, I sprinkle it on when we cook, cook them. And then when we actually eat them, I put a little bit more on if I think it needs it. But it's it's just such a lovely, well-rounded flavor and is very, very tasty. So what we need is our sea salt, which is 300 grams. And, whoops, I always forget this has got a little mat it sits on. And we need our one orange. Now I haven't got big oranges here. I, 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 you don't need a big orange. And you're going to take off the stalky bit and then just peel as thinly as you can. And if you're good at using the peelers, use that, but I'm not, as you know, I tend to sort of cut myself with them. Get cat candy. So I just peel it um, already. All those oils get released and it, it, it's a lovely fresh burst of citrus. I, I don't think it would quite work the same with, with lemon or lime in this. You really can match your ingredients together with these things and experiment. And I hope that you're starting to feel confident to do that now and, and try out things and uh, not quite stick to the recipe. So that's what preserving is all about. So take it off with as little of the white bit as you can. You don't need the inside bit for this, but you can use it for something else. They always say that, don't they? Glibly say, oh, use it up. But you can just eat it, of course. There's a sort of discolored bit there. I won't put that in. It's only a mark on the skin. So uh, I'll put that back there for the moment. Now I'm just going to roughly chop this so it's not too big for the machine to cope with. You know, if you, it depends on the machine you've got. If you want to chuck it all in and chance it, then. But it, what you end up doing is, it, is you're fishing out bigger bits at the end that haven't quite processed. I've tried to put the uh, books up there for you. I've, I think the salt one is still available. I, I generally check them all, but I forgot to check the salt one. No. But um, if not, look out for it in charity shops and things like that. So that's our the um, peel from the orange. And in my uh, little collapsible colander here, I have the herbs. Now, you can just take off the top bits. The soft uh, stem bits are fine. If you've got any woody stems, you need to take those off. And I've got my little uh, stripper here that you put the, um, I haven't used this very much, I'm not very good at it, but you just put the stalk through and pull it from the other side and it strips the leaves off and leaves the stalk behind. In theory, there we go. And there's all the leaves. So if you've got a lot to do, it sort of uh, will save you a bit of time. But the soft bits at the top are OK. So you've got different size holes. So you can even do things like kale and things like that in it. As usual, cat handed. The herbs are very um, soft, actually, because they're very new. They're very uh, fresh and green. New th this year's growth. So you can strip it down like that. Oops. It doesn't matter how much you put in, it's up to you really. Um, I've given a guide on the recipe there, but um, if you want to put more in, do so. Uh, or change it for different herbs if you've got some different things. It's a lovely smell though. That, uh, try and pick herbs on a sunny day 
um, and they're not damp or wet. You don't want them. Uh, and try not to wash them. I mean, if they're if they're not near a sort of dusty road or anything, just keep them dry. It, give them a good shake. Make sure there's nobody living in there. But um, other than that, you know, washing them kind of bruises them, and you start losing the flavour. So. Right, I think that's probably enough time. And then uh, the rosemary, I'll take that top one out. And put it, oops, put it through my, no, it strips all the leaves off. Oop, <laughs> leaves it lovely and clean. They're a bit woodier stems, so they're easier to do. The um, when they're a bit uh, firmer in the summer, you can use the stems uh, for sort of barbecue skewers and things like that. Without it, the leaves are off, uh, so that adds flavour because every part of the herb will have the flavour that it's known for. Is they're not just in the leaves, so. Um, you know, don't waste them if you could, if you can avoid it. Right. So there's our little pile of uh, herbs and zest. Uh, so Elizabeth, do you have a ratio for the herbs, like one part rosemary to two or three parts thyme? Well, the recipe is uh, a few sprigs of thyme and one sprig of rosemary because it's quite strong. Um, it depends on your own personal taste. It won't make any difference to how long the salt lasts or anything like that. You know, if you don't particularly like rosemary, then don't put it in. Put more thyme in or put something else in instead. You can literally use what you have or what you like. And as I keep on saying, only make things that you like. There's no point making things that you have a, an inbuilt resistance to because you don't really like them. The only reason for making things you don't like, maybe something grows naturally around where you live and you think, well, I don't want to waste it. Well, make that and make that the one you give away to people who are always pestering you for things that you've made. So give them the things you don't like. Or if you make to sell, of course, you don't need to like everything. You can use uh, what you have, what you can forage, and foraging for me involves markets and, and friends' gardens and things like that. It's not just sort of tripping along the hedgerow with a little basket picking blackberries. It's anywhere and everywhere that you find uh, produce that you can use. And don't forget the parks in cities now are mostly being planted up with fruiting trees and bushes. And then they all drop to the ground and get wasted because nobody wants to be seen taking the fruit. But that's why they've been planted is so that people who live in cities can have access to fruit trees and things that they can use. So don't ignore them or think that they're not allowed. Um, I'm just going to get a spoon for this sort, otherwise you know it's going to end up all over the place. So what I generally do is put some salt in the bottom of my little whizzer here. Use whatever you've got if you've got a, a you know a food processor or whatever. But I quite like this because it's easy to wash up. Uh, you can get everything out once you've made it. And then what I do once I've got a layer of salt, I sprinkle in some of the bits and pieces, and then I put more salt. Otherwise, you end up some some of it sort of processes before the rest. You will know the strength of your machine and act accordingly. If you need to do it in two or three small batches, then do that. If you haven't got a machine or you don't want to use a machine, just chop the herbs finely, zest the orange peel with a fine grater and use a fine sea salt you can get it all ready 
uh, really fine. You don't have to use the flaky one. You can get it ground down and just mix it all together. It might look a bit more rustic, but that doesn't matter, does it? It's uh, So there is another layer, more salt on the top. I just find it blends more easily if you do it like this. And then tip the last little bit in. Now get the lid on, that's easier said than done. Get it lined up, hopefully. There's my top. The beauty about these are that they you can't start it or use it unless it's all connected up properly. So but that's got its downside that you've got to get it exactly lined up. That's better. Goes on. Now the noisy bit. I'm going to give it a bit of a stir around. Few more bits to do. Tend to get stuck in one place. So um, smelling good. still see a few lumps but when we come to the next bit you'll be able to see so, you know most times you, you can't do absolutely every last little bit so for whatever reason um, but it doesn't matter so there we are that's your salt in there which is going to pleasing mix of green bits and orange bits and there's a few lumpy bits so next uh what you have to do with most of these get rid of the sharp bit i'll put it in there is they just need to air dry overnight would i recommend woody herbs friend is asking not the woody bit uh, you can use woody herbs, but you need to get the leaves off um, because they just won't. I mean, they wouldn't be pleasant to eat, really. Uh, and Elizabeth's asking if I, I ever add pepper. Uh, I do, actually, but then it becomes, for me, a different thing. I call it a rub. So it's a more comp complex thing. It's got layers of flavour with the pepper. Uh, you can add um, the Chinese five spice, um, five spices like uh, star anise and cloves and things like that. And you're making essentially the same thing with a salt base, some pepper, the other spices, but you're making something that has a different kind of purpose, really, of, of a rub onto marin sort of marinating meat and things like that. But by all means, experiment, put in whatever, whatever floats your boat, whatever is your sort of indigenous um, herbs and plants around you, uh, wherever you live, you know, don't restrict it. This is, this is just a method. All, all of that we're doing over these workshops is teaching you methods and ways of utilizing things. You know, like when we didn't have the, um, uh, elderflowers you know well we use a different flower and you might ha not have elderflowers where you are so you, you but you know the method and you can use that and this is the same thing so what we need to do because there's residual moisture which you don't really want to trap into the jar straight away is you take a just an ordinary tray 
I have one with chickens on, of course. Uh, an ordinary tea tray or something flat. It doesn't have to be a tray, a baking sheet, something like that. And then some baking parchment paper, or you could use uh, kitchen paper, anything that makes it easier to get it back off the tray, basically, because otherwise you'll be trying to, um, like this, you can pick it up and tip half of it in and that kind of thing. So you just need to take off a piece that's big enough, roughly. This is a new one, so it's quite heavy. I haven't done that very well, of course, but never mind. Put that on your tray. Uh, Elizabeth was saying she dries the citrus zest first. Um, no, I, I put it straight in because I want to capture the oils. The, the zest doesn't really have a lot of moisture. It has oil, which is a, is a different thing. Um, so now I'll put it my spoon. You just need to spread it out on the paper. And you can see there's some lumpy bits. And those we'll take out. It hasn't processed, it won't, you know, there's plenty of uh, zest in there, you can see it. And so any bits that are like that, you can just remove. Or it might be that you've got a few big herb leaves in there, you know, it, it um, depends what you're using it for, if it's for you. I mean, you wouldn't want a great big piece of orange peel in there, but uh, if you don't mind the herb leaves being in there and it's for your own use, then there can be. But you spread it out as evenly as you can. And this is why I like the, this kind of mixer. You don't have all that scraping around the blades and everything in the bottom. You can just take it out and it's really easy to wash up. <laughs> all goes in the dishwasher. <laughs> Trev's put the link on there, on there for you. We sell it on the website. But uh, so spread it out fairly evenly, and then just leave it to air dry overnight. You don't need to cover it up unless you've got inquisitive uh, cats or something like that. You know, put some kitchen paper over the top. You don't want to seal it. You want the residual moisture to just waft off into the air and every time you come out into the kitchen to make a coffee or something you'll get a lovely rich smell of what you've made and then the next day it might set in a sort of crispy layer but you just break it up with the spoon or something and make it sort of all, all granular again and then put it into your jars or however you're going to store it I mean you could store it in 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 Ziploc bags and things, but I think it's quite nice to keep it away from plastic if you can. But um, it doesn't need any refrigeration. It doesn't need to be put anywhere special. And probably if there's nice colors to it, just keep it out of strong sunlight. Um, but just have some fun mixing and matching your herbs. And, and you, do, you don't have to put citrus in, as I've shown you. You can just use truffles, herbs on their own, wild garlic, absolutely anything goes and as I say I'm going to experiment with um, I've bought some licorice and I'm going to experiment with that and I have seen people doing vanilla salt which I think would be quite interesting um, so uh, I'm guessing if you think about you have chocolate now with um, uh, sea salt in and things perhaps if you flavored it first with things like the licorice and then added it into things like that that might be uh, quite a fascinating experiment. But that's how it ends up. You don't need to do any more to it than that. Um, and I just think they're lovely. You can do things like um, lemongrass. You can put some ginger in, garlic, whatever, whatever you feel like. Uh, Elizabeth says uh, did a silicon paper, parchment paper in the United States. Yeah, that's non-stick baking parchment is what I have but as I say if you just want to put ordinary kitchen paper on there first that's fine as long as it's clean I mean you could use a clean tea towel but I just find it's easier to scoop it up 
and put it in the jars. And then the last bit, you can pick the paper up and sort of use it as a funnel uh, and you don't end up sort of trying to pick up little bits of salt everywhere. It's just easier to put it on something. But, um, so that's our salts and I hope you'll have some fun making them. I'm just gonna show you some things from last week. Uh, you know, I said that I'd made some tarragon vinegar and I had it in a in the big jar, which was white wine vinegar with fresh tarragon. And that's, it goes to this rather uh, not very exciting khaki color in the jar. Uh, so that's the second jar. The first jar I have strained, put through a sieve and I bottled it. And I bought some more tarragon because mine isn't in the garden yet through my farm box. And I put a little sprig of tarragon in the bottle and then poured in the vinegar. So it's a much better color away from all its leaves. And then there's a fresh sprig in the bottle, which is a nice thing to do. Um, so that's the tarragon vinegar. But then of course, because I bought some fresh tarragon to go in the bottles, I had more tarragon. So I've made a second jar. And I think I might go on like this forever if I'm not careful. But I've also made some tarragon salt to, uh, with some of the leaves. And that would be lovely rubbed into the skin of chicken before you roast it. Don't tell the chickens out there. They were <laughs> we don't eat our chickens. Um, so it would be lovely. It would be lovely on fish. It would be great and used on a salad to season it. You could use the tarragon salt, the, the vinegar and some olive oil. Uh, you know, just I didn't want to waste the tarragon. So I've made some tarragon salt and that will be for our use. And then you may remember the Persian pickled garlic. Now, I found this recipe uh, in my oldest recipe book, and I thought, why haven't I made that recently? I remember making it a long time ago, and I thought, why did I never make it again? And I'll show you why I didn't make it again. <laughs> it's because it goes this rather alarming blue colour. The coriander's all got in the way, but you, can you see the garlic cloves have gone blue? And I remember now that's what, what happened the first time after I peeled all of this garlic, it went blue. Now I looked it all up and this is because garlic has sulfur in its um, makeup, in its cells. Some, it's a sulfur derivative, I can't remember the chemical name. And the um, vinegar breaks down the cells of the garlic a little bit and releases amino acids which combine with the sulfur and turn everything blue but apparently it's quite safe to eat <laughs> so i'm going to persevere with it. it and if you're if you make this and it goes blue don't be alarmed i think it may uh vary from from garlic to garlic depending on which you know um, variety you've got but it's safe to eat and I, we shall eat it here, but I won't make it to sell or anything like that because I wouldn't be able to explain it sufficiently to a customer to encourage them to eat it, I'm sure. But uh, I just didn't want you to be alarmed if you'd made it and that's what had happened. So uh, that's all we've got on the table tonight. Uh, thank you for listening. And next week will be uh, an introduction to dehydrating food. We won't be making anything, but there will be a lot to look at and a lot to make notes on. But I hope that you'll uh, come along for that because it's a fascinating subject. It's the one thing I kick myself for not getting involved in years and years ago uh, because it, it's endless, the possibilities. So uh, we'll have a little introduction to it next week and I'll show you some of the things that you can do and then uh, the Simply Preserved magazine is uh, going to be out in the next few days online. We're starting a dehydrating feature in there every month. So there'll be something um, that you can do uh, and it will be an introduction to simple dehydrating and food. This month's magazine is all about mushrooms. So it, the dehydrating is about mushrooms. 
and each month we'll go forward, we'll have a section on dehydrating. Uh, so uh, I'll see you next week and happy salt making.